um, privilege tonight to, uh, as I said, have one of the new, powerful, very important voices in the Native America Speaks program. Um, 36 years young, the Native America Speaks program, the longest uh, running uh, indigenous speakers series uh, in any national park in the country. Um, you know, my, our, all of our friend Jack Gladstone um, was, you know, involved in the founding uh, of, of this important program. And one of our, our mission is to preserve and protect Glacier National Park for future generations. And to do that, it takes the next generation of leaders to step up and, and help us own that narrative in a way that is compelling and important and authentic. Um, and no one does that better um, than our guest tonight, um, Rose Bear Don't Walk. Rose um, joins us from uh, St. Ignatius. Um, I am, as I have said, not a huge fan of the drive from uh, to Flathead to Missoula, except for the St. Ignatius corridor, which I think is one of the most beautiful places um, on earth. Uh, Rose uh, went, got her undergraduate degree at Yale uh, in 2016, um, came back to Montana to get her master's degree uh, in uh, environmental studies. Studies, yeah. Uh, yeah, at the, at the University of Montana. Um, and was just last year um, given a fellowship for the future from the University of Montana um, and uh, is, an, is an ethno... Okay, here we go. Good. Yeah, that, you know, it's, it's the Zoom world. Um, is an ethnobotanist. I had to stop because I, I have a hard time getting, getting that out. And it's going to share with us um, tonight the work that she has been doing um, in that er very important area, um, which is part of what she um, speaks on when she speaks in the Native America Speaks program. So Rose, welcome to, um, to uh, this evening's event. And you know, maybe you just start out by giving us a little background about your path um, you know, from Montana to going to school back east and then finding your way back home. Yeah, no problem. Thank you uh, for that welcome, Doug. I'm really excited to be here um, and to just kind of share with all of you um, my work and kind of just what I'm really passionate about. Um, I did do my undergraduate in uh, Connecticut at Yale and um, in between grad school and uh, my undergrad, I actually came back home and I taught Salish language at my high school for about a year. Um, even though I don't think teaching is quite in the cards for me, um, it was a really good way for me to build a foundation in culture um, and understanding how culture and language kind of infuse our lives um, and how by learning more about those things that um, I just got more into what it means to be a Salish person and why culture and tradition uh, and all of these things are super important to me. So I did that in between. And then I kind of wanted to take my educational career a little bit further um, and kind of continued on this environmental trajectory. Um, but I took one class, um, it's called Plants and Culture. And I was just blown away by how plants are so instrumental to our everyday lives. Um, not just what we eat, but what we wear. Um, you know, what goes into our, um, like, our, our fragrance products, like all sorts of different things. Um, and it's really important to different cultures around the world and how using plants and having plants as a part of our lives um, just really enriches us as, as humans, as societies, as cultures. So um, I really wanted to kind of continue that and see where it could go. And that's what led me to the University of Montana. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier before before we began. We're do, we always gather a little bit early to make sure the technology um, works. And we were talking about how important, how all of us were feeling like we needed to be outside, right? And, and that's a, a part of this, that being in nature uh, is so significant and we take a lot of those things uh, with us. So... Um, Talk to us a little bit about, you know, you had a, a lot of areas in, in um, the, the idea of conservation of, of the environment. Um, what about plants specifically kind of floated your boat? 
Um, so when I did my undergrad, I learned a lot about um, food systems, uh, in particular food systems of America, food systems of um, Native America, and how drastically our diet has changed since pre and post colonialism. Um, and I think in studying political science and studying food systems, I really learned about the barriers, the history, um, the socioeconomics, uh, and the social issues that really have created this kind of um, schism between Native peoples and their foods. And I really wanted to do kind of a health focus. I think a lot of what I do in my own life, you know, just like hiking and running and um, being active really is um, prompted by this idea of wellness and being healthy. And so um, something about plants and uh, specifically food plants and how mm. they kind of provide us with this another, um, this next layer of health and wellness and how instrumental um, plants were to traditional diets. And, um, you know, besides the hunting and fishing, plants were really really key to how uh, indigenous peoples were among the healthiest um, in North America prior to colonization. And, you know, we hear, we hear a lot and you, you read some of the um, Omnivore's Dilemma and, uh, and other kind of books about, you know, food deserts, for example. And I think, mm -hmm. I think it would be the case on, on a lot of reservation areas that, that um, the influx of fast food might have created uh, that kind of, of a, a situation. And so what I hear you saying is that you're thinking about how here you can uh, talk about that and maybe, maybe help change that? Absolutely, yeah. I think that by incorporating more traditional foods um, and more food plants into our diets, not just you know as Salish people, but as indigenous peoples kind of reclaiming their traditional food systems, we can become healthier um, people and then also continue this really important cultural component uh, that's kind of been lost or had a couple barriers between it over the um, you know, past couple centuries. And so how did you come to learn about and become act involved in Native America Speaks program? So um, <clears throat> I've always uh, liked to go to Glacier National Park. Like I said, I love to hike. I love to run. Um, I really love glacial lakes and um, just being around water. So I've been to the park many, many times. Um, and I think just uh, Kelly Lynch from the uh, Glacier National Park. She just reached out to me because I think she read a couple of um, like news articles about kind of my work with food sovereignty and health and um, I guess uh, ethnobotany. And she just invited me to come down and speak um, because as I was becoming new to the ethnobotany world, I was like, oh, okay, there's probably a ton of these plants that I'm studying at the park. So it'd be really cool to check those out. And so um, she invited me to come speak, and it was a really, really great experience. Well, it, um, it you know, clearly it has a huge impact, and I think that, the, again, these these new voices, your your generation is that generation that's going to have to, you know, continue this, right? I, I turned 60 last week, and, you know, it's great for me at the end of my career to be able to kind of be all in in something, but but part of my job is to, is to, really highlight new voices and we really appreciate um, your stepping up and being being involved in the program and being a leader in the program um, and I really appreciate tonight you've uh, been super generous and have put together a little bit of a program um, for us so um, I want to kind of turn it over to you to walk us through um, you know and, and give us a sense of what you're doing and and um, uh, I, I, I we're super excited to be able to see a little bit into your world Rose. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I do. I'm going to share my screen in a second, but if anybody has any questions, um, kind of drop it in the chat box. Uh, if, if something I say doesn't make sense to you, um, I'll try to I'll try to like describe it in my presentation. But if there's anything that you need more clarification on, just drop it in there. And then please have like so many questions about plants or uh, whatever else you want to talk about, because I could talk about this all night. <laughs> <laughs> So I will share my screen. Okay. 
Um, all right, can everyone see that? Thumbs up. That's great. All right. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick little introduction, kind of just going off of what we already did, discussed, but um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Rose Baird Walk. I am bitter, Salish, and Crow. Um, I grew up on the Flathead Indian Reservation pretty much my entire life. Um, I'm 26 years old. And I'm still living here um, and kind of continuing the work that I um, was doing in my master's program. But prior to that, uh, I got a, a BA in political science from Yale University with a focus in environmental policy. Um, and then went on to teach Salish language um, and recently just got my master's of science in environmental studies where I focused my master's thesis on traditional Salish food plants um, and the relationship that Salish people have um, kind of created and cultivated with food plants over time. My master's thesis, if any of you want to take a look at it, uh, is called Recovering Our Roots, the Importance of Salish Ethnobotanical Knowledge and Traditional Food Systems to Community Wellbeing on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Kind of a long title. If you can't remember that, um, you can probably type in Bear Don't, Rose Bear Don't Walk and it'll pop up. Um, currently, my work is situated with Indigenous Pact, which is a, a public benefit company that works with traditional or it works with tribal nations um, in issues of health and healthcare. And um, so currently, I work as a consultant with them, just kind of picking up projects. Um, and helping them with um, kind of cultural knowledge or seeing what we can do to better health systems and healthcare for indigenous peoples across the nation. Um, like Doug, Doug said, I'm a 500 Women Scientist Fellow for the Future. Uh, the fellowship was created by 500 Women Scientists, which is an organization that highlights women in science um, and makes it possible for them to operate in um, and have a support group essentially for um, more women to be included in the world of science. The, the Fellowship for the Future is specifically for women of color. Um, and this is the first year that it's been awarded. So I'm very lucky to be included in this group of um, amazing women. There's four of us, uh, women of color in STEM professions that are working on projects that kind of combat um, social inequality and injustice in their respective communities. The little, uh, the little drawing up at the top uh, was done for the fellowship. Um, it's basically highlighting me and the work that I do, um, kind of all of those facets included in there are what I focus on in my work um, and my studies as well. Okay, so um, we're all here because we love Gla Glacier National Park. I love it. It's a beautiful spot. Um, and I think it would be really important for us to kind of situate ourselves um, in terms of talking about land and time and space. So um, when we talk about land or in a better sense, you know, territory, um, we kind of look past the history that we have on the lands that we currently reside on. And so this is a map that's been put together. Um, it's available online, but it basically shows all of the traditional territories of different indigenous peoples across the world. I just highlighted this part because it's North America. You can see all of the overlapping um, and the different traditional names used by the respective culture that lives there and uses that land. Um, and if you think about the land that Glacier National Park is on, um, and even the land that I'm situated right now, the Salish and the Blackfeet had a huge part in um, learning about cultivating relationships with um, and practicing traditional foraging, hunting, um, trading, different things like that in that territory. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. Um, and I think that Glacier has a really um, good uh, relationship with those tribes. Um, but 
I think as always, we can, we can do better. And I think land acknowledgement is another good way and a good tool to kind of continue that good relationship. Um, so uh, this map you can find later on, I have a link to it, but um, I wanna talk a little bit about how I got to the particular work that I'm in. So um, epidemiology is basically the study of disease and health patterns in different groups of people. And for indigenous people um, in particular, the post-colonial disease patterns that we come across um, post-colonization uh, started with infectious disease, which knocked out a lot of um, population, malnutrition, followed by obesity, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and depression. Um, prior to that, a lot of the deaths related in indigenous communities came from uh, environmental factors, as well as intertribal warfare. Um, but you can see that as um, kind of westernization kept going in these communities, we have a lot of chronic disease patterns. Um, and those kind of weren't very prevalent in our communities prior to colonization. Um, currently, American Indians manifest the highest rates of diabetes, um, obesity, as well as hypertension, um, and um, kind of other, I guess, nutrition-related uh, diseases. And so I think there's a really direct link between what we eat uh, the relationships that we have, the practices that we have in our daily lives, um, and how we are in our whole being in terms of health and wellness. And so in tackling um, kind of these issues with health, issues that I see in my own community and in my own family, um, I kind of wanted to dig deeper in how we can combat those um, epidemiological patterns and kind of um, turn them around into a into a more healthy, healthier culture. Um, and so this turns me to food. Um, food is super important. Uh, we all use it, we all need it. Um, and I think for uh, traditional cultures, food is incredibly important to overall being. Um, our entire lives were situated around hunting, foraging, understanding the landscape, understanding the environment, um, and kind of cultivating relationships with our food systems. And so um, in some of my research for my master's degree, you know, small amounts of traditional foods consumption improves your diet quality and also um, provides you with a lot of social and cultural benefits. Just today, I, um, I had a day off, so I'm really excited to you know, be here and share this with you. Um, but I also went and picked choke cherries. Um, and choke cherries are one of my favorite uh, traditional foods because I grew up uh, picking them with my grandpa. And I think a lot of us can have these food-related memories and these relationships with our foods. Um, and I think that becomes deeper when we go outside and we pick it and we interact with the land and we interact with the food itself. Um, and so when we have a decrease in the transmission of that particular knowledge base, um, it affects, you know, how the food is being used in modern day, but it also affects a lot of the cultural components like language and traditional teaching and inter intergenerational knowledge, um, knowledge bases, because a lot of us have learned about these food traditions through other people and through oral history. It's not really something we kind of picked up in a book. Um, and uh, I think it's really important that we understand that we can have this relationship even currently. So um, that's why I wanted to go specifically with food. And um, I, most of my pictures have some, um, what are those called? Oh my gosh, uh, some titles on them, but not all of them. But this one, these are canvas bulbs, which are really, really important and fundamental to the Salish diet. Um, so how do, how do we get here? How did we get to these um, chronic illnesses that are really rampant in our communities? Um, if we took a look at that traditional territory map, I have another map that I'll show in a second. Um, you take this large land base and you take this large, um, 
I guess, longstanding relationship with the land that people have cultivated over thousands of years, um, and you move that somewhere else, um, and then you force that culture to assimilate to a different one and assimilate to a different food system that their bodies are not equipped to, um, you know, n very negative repercussions can happen. And so relocation of tri tribal nations from their traditional territories um, and then removal of them from that area to areas like reservations, um, into cities, things like that. Um, and then Western assimilation, um, basically wanting all people to um, transition to a more Americanized way of living really had an impact on how indigenous peoples had relationships with the land, with themselves, um, with their community, things like that. Um, Another thing is the federally subsidized food distribution program. Um, it began a tra trajectory of authority over food um, in the introduction of foreign poor quality um, foods in indigenous nations. And um, I mean, not to get too historical here, but because of treaties and because this of this nation to nation relationship between the federal government and tribal nations, um, the federal government has a duty to provide health care, um, food, uh, land, and a couple other things to tr tribal nations, but there's no specification as to what types of food. So you're going to take Western European foods and give them to these indigenous nations, and then you're fulfilling your treaty duty. But in reality, um, that had such huge consequences for the health of native peoples um, and this transition from traditional food practices and traditional diet to the american lifestyle really um, like created this decline of traditional food knowledge and practices and the health issues that we see today um, and so this is one of the maps that i have um, and that i use in my research and just to kind of highlight this idea of what was traditional territory how did that um, diminish over time especially with the establishment of reservations um, you can see that blue area was the traditional territories of the pondere and the salish and then you take that huge large area and you condense it down to this smaller one where um, I'm at today that's going to have an impact um, and that's kind of the same story for a lot of tribal nations in Montana and across North America. Um, the other graphic is uh, place names in the Bitterroot Valley which is where um, kind of our our home base is. Um, the Bitterroot Valley is kind of where Salish people um, connect to as their their um, traditional lands where they come from and um, learning through culture and learning through language a lot of the place names that are um, on this map really tell you a lot about the landscape itself and there's a lot of um, indigenous languages that have place names that do the same thing we have place names that say you know this place has a lot of um, a lot of camas this place has um, a lot of hills, a lot of valleys. Um, I think I remember there's one place where they talk about the wind coming through the area a lot because it's on a plateau. And so when we think about place names and we think about language, those really create the idea of landscape and cultural landscape in the minds of Salish people. Um, if we think about Montana, and I try to you know, remind myself of this, is like, when the Salish knew Montana, it wasn't even Montana. Um, it, it was whatever they called it in their language and um, how they knew it. And so just kind of thinking about those ways that traditional ecological knowledge or TEK kind of suffuses our minds with how to understand the landscape is really, really important. Um, and scale, uh, the word is, um, it's what we call ourselves in the Salish language. And um, it's the combination of two words, uh, skelch, which is meat, and stulich, which is land. Um, and so the rough translation of that is 
uh, flesh of the earth or meat of the land. So Salish people literally <laughs> came from the earth. Um, and that's why we have such a strong and important relationship to it. Okay, so, so plants. Why did I focus on plants? I mean, I did talk about, I took this plants and culture class and it totally blew my mind and plants are all around us. Um, but another reason why is that plants and animals prior to humans arriving, and this is told in our creation story, um, they, were the, they were the first beings on the earth were plants and animals. And so the Salish looked to plants and animals as our teachers. Um, a lot of plants came to us in really trying times in our history. Um, plants have stories of how they came to us. They have a history. They have a place within the world that preceded humans. Um, and that is just incredibly, like, it just makes me feel so small. Um, and really makes me want to have a better understanding as to why plants are so important. And so um, traditionally, Salish women are also the keepers of traditional plant knowledge. And this is something very common across um, a lot of indigenous nations uh, because the men would hunt and fish and so they would go out for maybe weeks at a time. And while they're away, the women foraged and they gathered and they processed and they cooked and they kept the families going. I mean, they really did a lot. They did it all. Um, and they kept all of that really important cultural knowledge about when do we pick this? Why, why do we process it this way? How do we know that this is safe to eat? Things like that. And um, that's a role that's really transgressed through time. And because I grew up going to a couple, you know, gathering ceremonies and participating in those things, it's really important for me to continue that role um, and continue kind of keeping that knowledge alive. And so um, personally, I don't actually know how to hunt or fish. And so those are things that I want to learn, uh, but I've always kind of had a relationship with plants. And so they're very important to me. Um, and going from left to right, uh, that's a wild raspberry. The middle is a nodding onion and the right is uh, a camas flower. So that flower rises above the bulbs that we saw in the earlier picture. Um, and so this is why I wanted to do my work with plants because I think plants um, can be food and food is medicine and by kind of rekindling our relationship with that particular knowledge base that's kind of been lost over time um, is just really important and fundamental to who we are as Salish people. There are still lots of people that hunt and fish around here, um, but as far as plant knowledge and identification and processing, um, that's something I kind of want to bring back and share with everyone. Okay. Um, kind of getting the, the crowd engaged here. This is a little quiz. Um, we don't have to like turn on mics or maybe we do, I don't know. Um, but I just want to throw this out. How many of these plants are edible? And I can't see the chat, so I don't know what people are saying. Cheryl just commented all of them. Ooh, Cheryl, yes, good <laughs> job. Um, yeah, all of these plants are edible um, in some way, shape, or form. So um, the top left is a glacier lily, um, and all of these are actually um, instrumental to the Salish diet. Um, and the Salish people knew hundreds upon hundreds of plants that they use for food and medicine. Um, so we have glacier lilies on the left, um, which you can eat all parts of. They make great salads. Um, the next photo is a wild chai, which has a really beautiful um, flower. And I've only been able to find them in alpine environments, um, but they're delicious either way. Um, then we have fireweed, which is a very common wildflower that people see in Glacier, um, basically all about all around Montana, 
Um, and you can eat the flowers or you can dry the flowers um, and use them for teas. Um, and then uh, next is one of my favorite food plants. It's the spring beauty, um, also known as Indian potato, um, because it's kind of one of the first little spring edibles to show up after you know a hard, hard winter. And there are these beautiful tiny little flowers. And they make these little, little bit, little tiny potatoes um, that look like potatoes and they taste like potatoes, but they're very small. So they're kind of more like a snack, um, but they're just really gorgeous. And then we have a kinnick, which um, a lot of Salish people use the leaves um, to mix with their tobacco for smoking pipes, but actually those flowers will make little berries um, and you can throw those berries in a skillet with some oil and heat them up and they actually like become this really kind of nice, um, sort of like popped amaranth, I guess, would be a good way to describe how that is. But um, it's very like kind of soft and floral and fragrant. So um, you can eat that. There's the thimbleberry, which is my personal favorite berry, aside from choke cherries. And then we have elderberries. I actually took uh, that photo in the park, um, saw a bunch of elderberry trees. And then the right bottom is biscuit root. Um, it's a type of lomatium. You can dig the root up and eat it. Salish people would dry it um, and then make a flour and pound that out and make it into little biscuits. So um, all of those plants are edible and all of those photos were taken by me. And um, that's why I just, I love plants so much because there's so many, um, there's so much biodiversity and so much diversity in the diet. Um, so this is just um, an excerpt from my master's thesis where I really just dug into the botanical and the cultural components of traditional food plants. Um, this is just a list. It's a list of their Latin name, which is really important in order to ident like positively identify them. Um, and then we have a common name and then the Salish name. And so um, I really wanted to highlight the Salish name and the Latin name because those are the two, I guess, most prominent and most impactful ways that I understand identifying plants and knowing plants. Um, and the ma major food plant categories of the Salish were roots, shoots, berries. There were a couple nuts um, that I found in my research. Uh, like one mushroom, which is the fungus. Um, and then on really hard times, they would eat bark or if they wanted a nice treat, um, so those people would eat the inner cambium layer because it's nice and sweet. Um, and then we have primary foods, which are the bitterroot and the camas, which we dig in like large amounts. Um, and then we have secondary plants. So like things like glacier lilies or spring beauties that we don't eat a ton of, but you know, still consider to be important. Beverage plants, things to make teas, um, and preservation plants, what people use to kind of help preserve meats or use in other cooking um, methods. And so that's just kind of a running list. I mean, there's so much more for me to learn, um, but that's what I have so far. And so um, all of this really revolves around traditional ecological knowledge and that kind of intergenerational transmission from um, you know, the, the original Salish people and how they pass down this knowledge to the next generations and how we can do that for the next generations ourselves, um, as well as combining science to really kind of infuse that a little bit more. Um, because I do think that culture and science can really be a positive tool to helping indigenous communities when it's used in the right way. Um, so these are just some of the some of the really important like kind of botanical and cultural things that I've learned is we have the Salish words for these different um, plant morphologies, the roots and the leaves and the stems and the flowers. And we kind of all know that as to be what makes up a plant. Um, but if you go deeper and we look at what the Salish, um, you know, called these pieces, we learn a lot about their conceptual, conceptualization of the of the world and of the landscape um, and so um, 
the the root the the root of the word the root <laughs> is oh and that means to be strung out like a string because that's kind of the way the roots look underground um and ep loosely means a beginning so roots are the strung out beginning it's where the plant starts and where it can grow from but then we also see that um that root word oh in how we reference our ancestors and how we reference our families because those are the beginnings of us as Salish individuals. Um, and so when I did my research, I sat down with a lot of Salish people and kind of just talked to them about their relationships with plants and how they gathered knowledge and how they understood um, plants and culture and language. And um, I sat down with a Salish linguist and that was um, super, super just mind boggling and informative to me because I learned all of these things. Um, and it's been really, really fundamental to how I can see plants now. Um, and that plant on the right is uh, an early balsam root. And uh, a fun fact I like to tell about it is that the, the petals that we see, the yellow parts, aren't actually the flower, um, they're bracts, which are modified leaves to protect the flowers. And so the little tiny brown parts that are sticking out, those are actually all individual flowers. Um, because they produce a seed, which we know, you know, um, some flowers do the same thing. So we eat sunflower seeds and they all come from a flower. Um, so all those pieces in the middle are flowers. Um, and that's what we call a composite in botanical terms. Um, so kind of just making sure I'm going uh, on time. Um, the goals in my fellowship um, are to continue learning as much as possible uh, about the land and about plants, but also how I can bring ethnobotanical knowledge to my community um, and inform kind of the larger population about the importance of conserving and having value for traditional food plants and traditional landscapes. So increasing um, Salish citizen knowledge and access to traditional Salish food plants. Um, what I wanted to do with my uh, fellowship was to have workshops where we would go out and harvest and process and eat. Um, but because of COVID, that didn't really happen. So right now I'm just putting out newsletters every two weeks about different Salish foods that are out and about and how you can prepare them in your own home. Um, and then another goal is to continue the traditional food plant knowledge of the Salish and make it more prominent, um, make it, uh, you know, accessible and um, I wanna kind of do this maybe through a Salish um, botany curriculum, a science curriculum, something that could kind of be used in schools to bring science and culture together um, and also just to learn about the natural environment. Um, another goal is to educate and incorporate traditional teachings, information and ways of life into the community, into my life, into my family. Um, because the more that we use these foods and the more that we use these teachings, um, our lives become enriched, not just physically or mentally or emotionally, but it has us um, facilitate stronger relationships with individual self, with our family, um, and with the larger community. And I think that helps us become stronger as a tribe. Um, and when we learn about the land and all that it does to provide for us and care for us, um, that gives us the space to have a, an appreciation for it and to um, overall protect it. Um, and these are the spring beauties, again, because I just, I can't get enough of them. They're just so cute. Um, so how can all of us be part of this larger conversation about conservation and food and health and plants. Um, so the, uh, the map I showed at the beginning, um, they actually created this handy little text, text that number um, and tell them where you're at, give them a zip code, they'll tell you what traditional territory you're on. Um, and it's really cool and they take it from that map itself. So then you can know a little bit more about the landscape um, and the peoples that uh, inhabited it. Inhabited it. Um, 
you know, myself, uh, like all of us, I'm sure here, um, try to have a conscious effort to do what I can to protect the environment. Um, knowing that all beings are really important, um, including the plants, including the animals um, and water bodies, I want to do everything I can to make sure that I'm not making a, a negative impact on it. And so, um, you know, this shows itself through my um, foraging habits. A lot of Salish um, ways of foraging actually try to do um, the least amount of damage to the land. So, you know, pick what you need, um, kind of leave leave some berries for the bears or whoever eats it. Um, and then there's some other stewardship and um, I guess other um, land practices that protect um, our environments that we use. Um, some other things, uh, support, supporting indigenous food companies, restaurants, groups, research communities, um, a lot of traditional, um, I guess, teachings and um, you know, traditional ecological knowledge and um, knowledge about the landscape. Uh, prior to kind of this moment that we're in, a lot of that research was done by non-native people coming into native communities, asking for that information, um, and then not really having a stake in it. Um, but I see a lot of young scholars um, that are native that are really trying to dig deeper into what it means to be a native scholar and also studying their own communities. So um, supporting those efforts is really important to me. Um, and I think universities and different institutions are doing that as well. Um, another biggie is increasing indigenous land access and knowledge and advocating for land return and land rights. Um, I think uh, rights to foraging and hunting in different particular areas have been limited um, due to treaties, due to land grabs, due to um, you know, people inhabiting these places um, and kind of building homes and things like that. And so the best way to ensure land access is just kind of continue to advocate for that um, and creating opportunities for tribes to do what they they want um, with the land and the resources because um, you know I live here where the National Bison Range is and we've been fighting for um, stewardship over that place for a long time and I mean prior to that being built we did um, and we stewarded the bison uh, the bison herds there and that was really important to us as a tribe so we're still advocating for that um, and then local food economies I mean they're so important uh, especially when we live in a place like Montana where there's tons of farms there's tons of co-ops there's tons of farmers markets meat producers cattle things like that um, we have the ability to participate that or at least bring it back into the community and not have it shipped off somewhere else. Um, so I think those things are really important. And, you know, grow garden, plant some seeds, go foraging, things like that. Those are all good ways to interact with the land um, and bring back um, food and wellness kind of together. Um, so in closing, uh, I just want to thank you guys for sticking with me here. Um, and this is just kind of a quote that I got from my research that I think just really shows how important traditional plant knowledge is um, and why we should all be learning about the plants um, and having a good positive relationship with them. So thanks. Uh, amazing. I have so many questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Great. I, I, you know, uh, somehow you're, you're able to get all of us, I think, excited about this idea of, of um, re-engaging in the things that are around us, right? We, we speed past a lot of things in our life. Um, so I have, I'm going to start with a, a question in the mundane and folks should feel free to uh, enter the chat. Madeline, uh, clearly, uh, uh, already went online and is uh, reporting in from the Miami territory. So nice. um, yeah, so that's awesome. I encourage people to to do that. I do. Th that's a great. That's a great hint. Um, so I'll start with the mundane. Um, what would I do with a camas bulb? Oh, um, so camas um, is a really good source of carbohydrates. 
Um, a lot of um, Salish cultures, even here and the Pacific Northwest have been harvesting camas. Um, and we bake them in earth ovens over three to four days. Um, traditionally, only women do that. Um, but I do know of people that uh, harvest camas, you can freeze it if you don't want to use it like right now. Um, but if you slow cook it for um, maybe, you know, 12 or 24 hours, it gets this beautiful caramelization on it. Um, kind of like an onion, how an onion gets like very sweet. Um, and it actually uh, changes the carbohydrates to inulin, which is a non-glucose raising sugar. Um, and it's easier for you to digest. And so if I were, if, if we were able to um, uh, advance 10 years into, into your work and um, I was down in your area and we were at, at the giant uh, indigenous farmers market that is taking place 10 years from now, what, what kind of, what, what would be the popular items that I would be seeing in the, in the stalls of, of the vendors down in, in the Salish country? Gosh, I don't. Oh, I don't know. Because um, we have this, um, we have this long-standing, I guess, um, idea about how we shouldn't commodify our traditional foods, and so I think um, being in a wage economy world, it becomes tough not to do that because we've seen the commodification of like huckleberries. I mean, right, huckle right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. They're huge. And then, um, you know, some of the things we've seen with that commodification here in Flathead is um, a lot of pickers just kind of bring up the entire shrub and it damages the shrub for the entirety of its growing season. And so, you know, we would never want to do that. But I think there is an opportunity to have like a co-op where maybe we could introduce trading methods back. Um, you know, trade some dry meat for some salmon or trade some camas for some um, some berries. I think that would be the ideal way of kind of bringing those um, um, foods back, but having that kind of cultural integrity with it. Yeah, I think that's super. And I, I really appreciate it. It's interesting because I, I, asked, I asked the question um, authentically, but out of a naive perspective from my own perspective, right? That, that one of the ways to educate would be to commoditize something and have people come and experience it. Um, and I think that's, that's really important that you gave a different answer, um, which helps. I, I think that's this whole idea that you talked about, the decrease in the knowledge base um, and how do we do that. Um, again, it, it's, Doing that authentically, I think, is super important to, to make sure that that happens and not doing it the way I think it should be done as an old white guy. Um, but that, I think, adds challenge to it, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. Be because no matter where you are, you, you know Walmart, and you know this kind of this, this way that we've pushed this. Um, so... Um, and I think I see Jill. I think Cheryl Taylor has a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Um, Cheryl just asked, "What would be some edible plants traditionally associated with various seasons?" So um, right now, uh, it's very interesting to see how the seasons have shifted. But um, we have a Salish calendar, and it basically says um, August is the huckleberry month, September is the choke cherry month. Um, I think July is like celebration month because people are going to powwows and things like that. But a lot of our months are kind of catered to those seasons and with plants. So um, I think the, the plants that come out in the spring would be things like yellow bells, um, glacier lilies, spring beauties. Uh, and then, you know, summer is very much berry season. We're stocking up, we're making jams, things like that. Currently, right now, um, choke cherries are very, um, they're getting very plump and juicy right now. So those are, um, those are available in kind of the fall time. Um, and then, oh, I think bitterroot is early, late spring, early summer, um, different things like that. Cool. Yeah. 
Um, and Linda just asked, and I was wondering too, um, how can we sign up for your newsletter that you had mentioned earlier? Yeah, so uh, my newsletter uh, is bi-weekly. It's called The Flathead Forager because I love alliterations. Um, and the way you sign up is if uh, you could just drop your email um, and I can put you on the list for that. Um, and that's, that's basically it. I just use a large listserv and kind of add people to it. Great. Cool. So Linda, if you want to be added and if anyone else would like to be, um, feel free to drop your email in the chat and we can definitely send that over to Rose. Mm -hmm. well, Rose, I, and, and the, on, the, on the kind of bigger, broader question of social justice, um, you know, I was, we, we really are focused today on social justice, meaning, um, you know, uh, community policing or, or, or violence, et cetera. But I, I, I want to kind of give the opportunity a little bit to kind of think about, help us think about social justice or, or um, systemic racism in a different way, going back to what you talked about earlier about um, the removal of, of Native Americans from uh, traditional lands, the changing and like, but even like my question, right? The, the, um, the way that there was this um, colonization, if you will. And, and so, so um, help, help us think through how that relates to this, this discussion of, of native food. So I think, I mean, this doesn't directly tackle your question, but one thing that immediately came to my mind was um, you know, the current moment that we're in, uh, the pandemic, coronavirus, um, because of all these chronic illnesses and the, um, the healthcare infrastructure uh, in tribal communities, because it's not fully equipped to serve in the best way possible, um, COVID-19 has hit indigenous communities incredibly hard, um, particularly, you know, the Navajo Nation, um, has just lost numerous numbers, has lots of cases. Uh, because of that infrastructure that they have, I mean, public health encompasses all sorts of things, housing, poverty, familial relationships, education, different things like that. Um, and a lot of Navajo people are asking, you know, tourists to not come in to their to their lands, to their, uh, to the national parks that are there. You know, Blackfeet closed off the side of Glacier National Park so people couldn't come in through there um, because they are a very fragile community. And so when, you know, I've, I've talked to a couple people that are, you know, thinking about going to Glacier or upset because these parts of Glacier are closed, um, it takes that social justice mindset to really plug yourself in to a community that is very at risk um, and you have people coming in from all over who want to, I, I know they want to enjoy the park and things like that, but there are, there are bigger things at stake there. And so when we think about food in that sense, um, you know, where does your food come from? Is it come from a packaged, facility in South America, somewhere across the world, who's harvesting your food. I know a lot of producers in California are suffering right now, um, but also their workforce is primarily um, migrant workers and uh, brown people, people of color um, work in our food systems and carry a lot of the labor for that. So how can we lift that from them? How can we use our local food economies so that we are lifting up our neighbors um, and not kind of continuing the burden of what a global capitalistic food system has created? Lifting up our neighbors, right? I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, that if we can leave together with one voice and, and do that together, I think that uh, we will have spent a wonderful, um, hour together, an hour that went very quickly um, because yeah. of the, of, of such a, the, the, again, I, I am so um, uh, honored, Rose, that you um, have kind of joined this movement and you've joined us tonight. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time and, and sharing so much of it with us. 
Um, I have to say um, that I wonder what I did with all of my years that you have accomplished so much in 26 of them. Uh, and, I, and I also know, and I think everyone on the, on the Zoom tonight um, uh, feels a little better about our future. Uh, with people like you active in this kind of um, work. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank everybody for your contributions. Uh, we've got a couple of more of these donor thank you events. Um, uh, in October, we're gonna be with Lee Rademacher and talk about dark, the dark skies movement um, in the park. And, and, uh, and that's gonna be exciting. And then Superintendent Mao is gonna spend an evening with us uh, in November, which is always a treat to be with Jeff. Um, uh, Rose Baradon Walk, thank you again for your time and for your work um, and for your passion. And uh, we really appreciate your being with us tonight. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And, and thank you, Doug, for just really allowing this space to kind of amplify these voices. And I'm really appreciative of you um, and your team and how you're keeping Glacier Park um, available for everyone. Well, we uh, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. It's it's work we love, um, and uh, you know they say if you find a job you love, you will never work a day in your life, and that's kind of the way we feel around here. So, um, again, thanks to everybody. Um, thank you, Rose, and we will uh, talk to everybody soon. And until then, be safe. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Doug.